All right, welcome everybody to the Elevate Academy. We are a place for student athletes, families of student athletes, anybody who loves sports. And today we have probably one of the most important topics and discussions that we could possibly have. And it's about race in America and how we can get to a place where we can all be kinder and nicer to one another. And I have on the show today, three former Brown lacrosse players, I guess four, if you conclude myself, four former Brown lacrosse players. And uh, we have Gary Nelson, Rasan Lindsay, and Chaz Woodson on the Elevate Academy today. Guys, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think, you know, we've been speaking for the last half hour off air. And, you know, this is such an important topic. And I just really appreciate the three of you coming on to be able to talk about it. But I guess just to kind of kick it off, you know, we've been having text messages and emails and, and then just prior about, you know, how do we frame this? And the one thing that I said is, well, I can't frame it as a white guy, you know, and as, as the guy who doesn't know what you've all gone through. Now, I would tell you, I don't think I am, you know, someone, you know, the term white privilege is thrown out a lot. I am definitely not white privileged. I was, uh, I grew up in a very abusive uh, home. And um, so I did not have that privilege at all. My mom was a nurse who raised six kids on her own. And, and um, you know, we dealt with a lot, of, a lot of crap ourselves. But, you know, what I don't know is I don't know what you guys dealt with. And I don't know what you're dealing with on a regular basis. So you know, we do have people that, that are on here that, that I guess, you know, I guess for me, the one thing that I've seen, obviously, it's so sad. I'm sure I'm going to get emotional like eight different times during this. It's so sad that it takes someone's death to, or multiple people's death, to actually get us to a point where we can actually have these conversations and, and talk about this in a more meaningful way. But I, in my lifetime, I'm 53, I don't think there's ever been a time where people are more open and willing to talk about, we have a fucking, sorry, Facebook, we have a problem with race in, in our country. So I think that's the first time in 32 shows I've cursed, so I apologize. <laughs> but we have a problem with race in our country. So um, Rasan, you wanna kind of kick us off here and how we can help frame this for people? I mean, I think, I think the first uh, sort of thing that, to talk about is, you know, that these things have been happening for a while, right? And if we look at the, the sort of history of um, race in our country, um, you know, 400 years, uh, you know, to the first 200 slavery was legal, right? And then yeah. you, know, you also have Jim Crow um, and segregation. And so if you really look at that, let's, let's just say you use Brown versus Board of Education as kind of like your inflection point where, where things start to become a little bit more normal, which we know is not really true. 66 years of quote unquote, like black people having the freedom to do what they want to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we talk about things like white privilege. I think the, the thing that's important to understand is doesn't mean you are privileged because you did not grow up privileged, but you do have white privilege in the sense that, um, you know, you're, you don't necessarily fear um, police officers. You actually see police officers as friends, um, whereas often black people do not, even if they're black police officers, right? And I think that's important to frame I've seen, I can't remember the guy, the ESPN guy that's talked, um, he's done this talk and people really like it. It's been passed around the internet a bunch. And he said, you know, um, you know, white on black police in crimes. And it's not just that. And I think that's important because um, one of the guys was black and one of the guys, it was, it was Asian, who sat and watched Derek Chauvin um, with his knee on George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes, right? In the Freddie Gray situation, it was a number of black police officers as well. Um, and so... It is, it is really about police brutality and a, and a mentality, but there's also a much larger um, issue of systemic oppression and that systemic oppression and, and, fr and frankly racial bias has led to much of the situation that you see today. So um, I think one of the reasons why we're at this point we're at where you see so many people out, so many people are marching and talking is that people actually have time to pay attention, right? If 40 million people out of work, um, people are isolated, and they're taking it in in a way that's completely different. You know, I heard people talking about um, Kaepernick's protest being, you know, 
you know, something against the flag. One, it was a national anthem, so it had nothing to do with the flag. And two, he said very clearly, it has nothing to do with that. I'm protesting, you know, the, the, um, the poor treatment of black people, and in particular, um, at the hands of police officers, you know, people, unarmed people being killed, um, black men and women, and even, um, you know, brown men and women as well. And sometimes, believe it or not, even white men and women are killed by cops who are unarmed. And, and so those kinds of things are completely separate from what people made it, which was this issue with the flag. If, I want, if you want to make an issue with the flag with me as a black person, I can make an issue with the Constitution, right? Three-fifths of a person. So I'm not even a person. I, why should I have to honor something if I'm not a person? Um, and so at the end of the day, um, it is a very um, hot topic, and it is one that a lot of people really don't want to think about and listen to. Certainly, people don't want to own privilege. They don't want to own their responsibility in it. One of the things you hear a lot of people say is, I'm not racist. And, and that's great, and that is certainly a start, but that is not enough. Because if you benefit from um, racist institutions, if you benefit from things that like, you know, you're far more likely to get financing, whether that's for a home or for a business or otherwise, you're far more likely to have access to education. You're far more likely to have um, access to, you know, healthy food and good health care and all those sort of things. You know, from an institutional perspective, you are privileged. And that's a very different thing than just not being racist, right? Sure, yeah. Right along those lines, I think one of the things that people uh, either forget or, or, or don't really process is that it's not necessarily about the advantage uh, of, of being white as much as it's also about the disadvantage of being born black in America. There are certain things that, um, that, that are advantageous to you because you don't have black skin. Um, and, and that's a, an important thing to, to remember, I think, in a, along the lines of uh, what Rasan was just saying about uh, being not racist. It's also not enough to not be racist, right? The opposite, um, somebody framed this very well. I think it was Sean King framed this very well. Um, the opposite of racist is not not racist, it's anti-racist, right? So right. what are we actually doing on a daily basis in order to recognize, acknowledge, um, and combat those uh, systemic racist issues that are that, that have been prevalent in our country for so long. Um, and, and it is an uncomfortable conversation, but it's uncomfortable for everybody. It's just as uncomfortable for white people, I think, as it is for me. Like, I don't, or I should say that the other way, it is uncomfortable, uncomfortable for me as it is for white people. I think one thing I, for me that, that uh, makes it uncomfortable is that I have benefited from white privilege. Like, very much so. The fact that I was in the school that I was in afforded me privileges that um, that a lot of my peers didn't have. Um, and, and I had that from age, whatever, eight to, you know, 18. And then being able to go on to Brown University, play lacrosse and then go on to Brown University. Like that's something that, um, you know, I was able to capitalize on some of these systems that were in place, but not everybody is fortunate enough to do that. Um, so I think that that's another just kind of important um, point to realize. And then even just uh, having this conversation, I felt personally like this was an important conversation to be a part of, but it was not a conversation that I wanted to be a part of. Um, I've had this conversation too many times over the years. I've had this conversation too many times in the last three weeks. Um, in fact, I have two pages of notes that I've just been jotting down every time something comes to my head. Note, note, note. Quick note here, quick note there in the middle of doing all these other things. And I wanted to get it out in kind of one uh, one statement. And as I started writing, I didn't make it through three notes before I was like off on this other tangent that was getting me exhausted, right? right. Because there's so many pieces to this to the point where I had to put it down and say, you know what, I'll, I'll have to write on this another time. Um, every aspect of this is exhausting, but it's a conversation that we have to lean into black, white, or other. We have to lean into this uh, in, in order to make some change here. Well, what's interesting to me is, you know, obviously with all of us, you know, having the connection to the game of lacrosse, um, there were two, and I've been connected with Harlem lacrosse for, for a long time, um, really from its beginnings. And, and once again, you know, we have another Brown connection with, with Harlem lacrosse is, you know, the CEO of Harlem lacrosse is another Brown alum. And, um, and Dom Starsha, who was my coach and, um, you know, legendary coach, you know, he's on the board of, of, 
of Harlem Lacrosse, but Harlem Lacrosse just came out with kind of a, a restatement of how are they handling this entire situation and what more can they do? And then the PLL, the Professional Lacrosse Players League, um, they came out with a statement as well. And it was, I, I thought both of them were actually strongly worded, but really necessary. You know, Gary, we haven't heard from you yet. You know, what, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I echo Chaz in that this is, this is a thoroughly exhausting topic, especially when you're, you know, I, I, I tend to watch too much news. And it's, it's really important that you step away from that from time to time because you get inundated with the images and, and the verbiage around, you know, around what is essentially hate. You know, when I, when I stop and think about, you know, what it is that's going on, Rashawn, you raise this great point. None of this ha even happens. If not for everyone being home at this time um, and out of work and, you know, sheltering in place because there's a pandemic, this would not have happened because people would have been busy going to work or ignoring this because that's what's gone on over the last several decades where, you know, black people have been killed, you know, at the hands of authority, but it's easy to ignore um, because for, it's, it doesn't affect a certain portion of the population. So, you know, that it's all happening right now and it's coming to the head in the way that it is, you know, this all had to happen this way, but yes, it's exhausting. But I think at the end of the day, you know, it all comes down to individuals and what's in an individual's heart. I mean, and I'll, and I'll try to put that in, in a different way. Um, I, was just, I have several friends that are police officers, NYPD. And, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. And I, and, and I said to one of them, wow, I really wonder, you know, the turmoil of, of a black police officer in today's climate. What must, going through, what must be going through that, that person's head? Mm -hmm. He's got to, you know, obey orders because that, it's a militaristic police, you know, the, the, the police, you know, are sort of a military, militaristic entity. So he's got to obey orders. But when those orders become something that, you know, don't sit well with what's in his gut and what's in his heart, what is that person supposed to do? And what are the ramifications of actually following your heart and your gut in those situations? Um, for, for us civilians, you know, I think it's important that we, you know, take a step back, everyone, as individuals and reflect on what's in your heart and what drives your behavior. You know, if, if in your heart, you find that you can look at someone of a different race and, and you, you find disdain or hate, I think that's something that you have to actually face. You know, you know the more I think about what's happening and you, know, you hear this language a lot around, oh, the, the truth is coming out about a lot of people. But you, you can't really run from your truth, which is to say, if you're racist, I'm not sure what I can do to make you not racist. You're racist. You have to self-reflect and wonder, where did that come from? And why do I feel this way? I mean, ultimately, why can I look at a black man or woman and not see an individual or see something that's less than human? Right. Why do I see a body of people when I look at that person? And why do I lump that body of people into something that I feel a certain way about? Why isn't that person on equal footing with me as a human? And I think that's the work that needs to be done for everyone right now. Well, and, and that may seem like it's kind of on the um, almost on the extreme side, right? But there's also so many people that have for so long been fighting the idea of being racist that they don't recognize or fighting so hard to not be racist that they don't recognize the racist things that they're a part of and doing and saying on a regular basis. I agree. And I think also, that is the they take advantage of. Right. Right. It's about right. the self-reflection. I mean, that, that is about not doing it because of some sort of, you know, some sort of penalty that you might have to face outwardly in the public if you act a certain way. It has to be about the individual and then, and, and what, how am I going to feel about this act? Not am I going to penalize them for that? You can balance them. And I think that's the problem sometimes is like they can think you're the exception, but in general, I don't like black people, right? So you being awesome and them loving you doesn't mean they love black people. It just means that Gary's cool, but still I'm not really cool with black people and I wouldn't want them to date my daughter. And right, he's an exception. Yeah, and that comes and, back and to why is he the exception, right? Because he reminds me of me and my friends and my family and the things that we're used to. He's not other. Um, and that's, that's an important, like you, you mentioned it earlier when we were talking in terms of like, not being black enough or he's he's not really black or yeah. you know like it, one of the toughest things to hear is is uh hearing somebody hearing a white person say um he's the whitest black guy i know 
Yeah. Oh, jeez. It's it, it's like it's amazing. Um, and mind you, some and of that we, is just from our sport too, right? Yeah, and a lot of that is really white. And, it, and it's I'm not just from the though. sport, but yes. In Baltimore, a lot of black people play lacrosse. People are like, how'd right. you come to play lacrosse? And I'm like, in Baltimore, plenty of black people play lacrosse. Right. They don't go in to play college lacrosse necessarily. And the ones you know about, because it's what you think about is St. Paul's, Gilman, Calvert Hall. Every public school in Baltimore has lacrosse. And a lot of them end up playing because a lot of them play football and the football coaches are like, you better, you got to put, they coach across and they tell me you got to play across too. So you have whole teams of black players. Again, they don't usually go on the play, you know, in college and stuff like that. But, you know, so, I mean, frankly, even black people will say, well, how'd you get, how'd you end up playing yeah. lacrosse? Um, but I think that the, the point you were getting also about um, it, you know, sort of you remind me of myself, the one thing you said, Gary, that I, I, I don't necessarily agree with it, which is, um, it's not, it doesn't have to just be self-reflective. You really can help people come to it. And one of the ways you help people come to things is, is through commonalities. Like what I was saying um, to Dave earlier, growing up poor actually gives him a lot in common with a lot of black people. You're unfortunately, if you grow up black in this country, you're disproportionately poor. You're just far more likely than the average person to be poor. If you grow up poor as a white person, you are, that is not as common but you probably have more in common in many ways, especially in terms of certain kinds of struggles as black people and not nearly maybe as much as the typical white person and certainly not as much as, you know, a wealthy white person in many ways. So those are things and those commonalities sometimes can help people understand. I, I am a, a firm believer that one of the reasons why Martin Luther King was killed was because the speech he was about to give was to sanitation workers, not to black sanitation workers, to sanitation workers. And his platform had brought it to be about, about classism and about poor people, right? And he became far more dangerous then because now it's not just black people. Now you, you, you've brought poor white people into this fold and they actually see something in a different way. Yeah, all of a sudden, all of a, sudden a, all of a sudden a light bulb goes off and goes, wow, listen, we, he's talking to me. And think about this. I think, this is some, I think there's a couple other things I want to hit on. I know you have questions. One is all lives matter. And the other one um, is... Uh, and I'll talk about All Lives Matter really quickly. You know, people say things like All Lives Matter. What that is, is willful denial of what people are saying. The Black Lives Matter movement is about saying, hey, Black Lives Matter just like the rest of Lives Matter. What the real, the real saying is all lives should matter, but they don't all matter because clearly Black lives don't matter in particular when you're, you know, and, and by the way, no one's ever seen a big march about some guy who got in a, a, a gunfight with police officers. That hasn't happened. It's about unarmed people being murdered. Amadou Diallo got shot so many times that one of the bullets went through the bottom of his foot, meaning he was already on the ground and they were still shooting, right? Through his hands too, yeah. And, yeah it's, un, it's unreal. And 41. So the fact that people don't see that and yet see that Dylan Roof, a guy who killed nine people in a church, was taken alive while he was armed, as, as well as the kid Cruz who killed all the kids in Parkland, right? If you don't see that there's a difference between that and an unarmed black man like George Floyd, who apparently tried to pass a counterfeit bill, or Eric Garner, who was selling cigarettes illegally, or Elton Sterling, who um, was selling DVDs, or Sandra Bland, who was pulled over for a traffic violation, right? Those are clearly very, very different examples. And people need to understand that. And so when people say things like all lives matter, it is, it is actually willful denial of the issue that's going on, which is just imagine, imagine an unarmed white person getting killed. Like, out of the blue and then it happening repeatedly right. by the way i know i can name three people three white people that have been killed by police officers and most of my white friends can't because it's not an issue they think about for me it's an issue i think about every day I've got two 14 year old black boys who are bigger than i am now right i'm worried about when they go outside that people think they're older than they are that they're instantly suspects because they're black even if nothing's going on they're constantly playing and running because they're kids right? Some people get scared of those things. And so these are the things that as black people we deal with. And it's, it's almost like, um, it's the difference between, PTSD. yeah, but I think it's the difference between like a, a, like a low grade headache every single day and a migraine right now may feel like a migraine. And for a lot of people, it's like, they're having this visceral reaction. I right. feel like a low grade headache every day. It never goes away. It's there every single day. I can never, I never can separate myself from my blackness even if I stay in my house all day. Can I ask you guys a question? And, you know, I didn't plan on going in this direction, but how, how much are you looking at it 
Because I, I do, I look at it and, you know, I told you guys beforehand when I graduated from college, I lived on 108th Street in Harlem and, you know, that's where I was and it was a super poor area. This was prior to Harlem, you know, resurging. It was a terrible area to live in, and I, but I had a great apartment. I took over from my brother and, and that's where I was. But you look today, how much of today's politics, and I'm not talking about today as in June 8, 2020, but how much of the politics and the political system, because you look at, you know, you look at, you know, you're from Baltimore, we're from New York, you know, Chaz is, is from Virginia. Um, how much is the political system just freaking broken that we literally can't fix it it's so broken that it's almost unfixable. But that's how I look at it sometimes. I, I, I kid around, but I said, I want to create a new party. I don't want to have Democrats. I don't want to have, I, I'm registered independent. You know, I want to vote on issues. And, but not, not Republican, not Democrat. How about the, the just the intelligence party? Every, everything that you do, you have to go, does this make common sense? Um, but it's, it, it, I mean, it's not broken. It's, it's working the way it was designed to work, to work in the first place. I mean, that's, that's the problem. And that's what we're fighting. And there's too many people that, that are, uh, you know, in place in, in, um, in place to hold that system up, right? Like nobody wants to change that system, or at least nobody from the inside. A really interesting point, Chaz. Oh, I, I, like, I can't, no even, I can't even believe what you just said. I, I just want to repeat it. It's working the way the system was designed to work. That's the system. That, that's what we. That's what you mean. That the institutions are built on it, and they're built to uphold it. Dave, two days ago, or maybe it's today, the Senate couldn't pass an anti-lynching bill. Today, 2020, that couldn't. That bill could not be passed by our government. And Rand Paul who is a libertarian, so they're the, like good Republicans, so to speak, almost, was, was one of the people against it because a paper cup could, could be considered lynching, right? When people do things like that and they go into semantics, when we know for an absolute fact what, he, what the anti-lynching bill is about. And yet, I would also say, one of the things is that people will say nothing's changed. That's not true. I have never walked out of my house and seen my uncle hanging from a tree or my neighbor or you know, you know, some other black person from my right. family. That's never happened to me. That did happen to our but grandparents, right? It has become much more subversive. And I think that's part of what we're talking about is- Isn't it, Well, you know, that's- of course, ra of course, racism has changed. It's gone, it's it's gone underground and it, it's hiding. It's still very much there and, it's, and then there, it's still pulling a lot of the strings, but it's very much there. And I think that you know, part of what is refreshing about all this are these open conversations. I would, I've always said this and I can say this to anyone, I'd much rather know that you're a racist, and I'd much rather you be a racist to my face. One hundred percent. I then, always say, let then, me then, know up front. I'd much rather know. Absolutely. One thing I will say about the political political system, though, I think that that people can get caught up in is typically when when Republicans say special interests, they mean unions, and when Democrats say special interests, they mean corporations, right? And so we get into this like kind of, you know almost like a group thing, like, well, obviously liberals don't want bad things to happen to black people, and clearly conservatives don't care. And that's not really true, because one of the bastions of liberalism is unions. Who do you think is protecting bad police officers? It's unions. unions. And, and quite often when you see the police officers who are killing people, they have had really, really bad records. I mean, you know, this guy, um, Chauvin, had been in the um, department for, I think, 18 years. Right? Yeah, it, it, it was 20 years, he had 18 different um, marks on his record, right? It was only a matter of time. And there are a number of people like that. Um, and so, like, liberals need to admit that. Like, if you're one of those people that holds up unions, then you're actually helping support the institution that keeps people like that in their jobs, which leads to these kinds of things. And I would also say to say that things can't change is also you know, not real because policy can, real policy change does make a difference. Stop and frisk was repealed in New York. It happened under de Blasio and not under Bloomberg where it obviously flourished. But um, the fact that it, it was repealed is a, is a big deal. And, you know, it, it's not um, the be all and end all. And there's still certainly a lot of police brutality you can see just from the demonstrations what goes on. But that one piece of your civil liberty 
people have gotten back. And so I think that's important to note as well. Well, I mean, how, how do we go from here? Because I, I really, as I said it earlier, I really feel like even for me personally, and maybe it is because we're all in, in a pause mode right now. We all are in a situation. I mean, even me having the ability to do the Elevate Academy show, you know, I, not, I might not have been able to do this if I was fully working and out on the field coaching and doing all the things. So, so now, you know, I am able to look at this and say, well, you know, what, what, what's my role in this and, and, and how can I help it? And that's why I wanted to have the, the three of you on the show. And, and it was, we mentioned, we could have had, you know, other guys on the show as well. And, you know, Billy Day and Kyle Harrison and, and all other, you know, players and, and, um, and, would, and Brian Silka, I, you know, Fred I, Opie, you name it. Okay. I would encourage, Go ahead, Gary. I, would, I would encourage you to also have that show. Because you're at, you know, when you think okay. about what is the role and what, and what should you be doing? Well, you're doing it. It's, it's this open dialogue. And it's letting people hear the real of what's going on and letting people talk about how they feel about what's going on. And, and that's what you're facilitating. My, what my suggestion would be to continue this in every way that you can. So have that show. Well, just just I, I would also say that just the fact that you're having the show says something about you know the fact that you actually care. You're looking at the issue. You may not understand the fully the issue, but you're trying to get better understanding, and you're actually broadcasting it out so that the people who come to your academy also understand that this is something important. I mean, one of the one of the ways that we tell people what's important is what we prioritize, right? And we need to understand that there there is actually an existential problem with human existence. Period. Right. And that, that existential problem is the difference between taking care of myself as an individual and doing what's right for the whole. And as an individual, that can mean family and friends too, right? We can put, because obviously if your family's not doing well, you're probably not that happy as, a, as an individual. But outside of that, what's really important? And I also say that it doesn't mean anything if people don't have something to lose. Let's be clear. You know, we come from a community of uh, you know, pretty, you know, elite um, and in some ways elitist community when you talk about lacrosse. Not everybody's going to be able to hear this conversation. I know for a fact that there are people on the team with me when I was at Brown that made racist comments. They never made it in front of my face. But my white friend told me about it because he wasn't about that life. Right. And he's, he's the kind of person who stood up for it. And, you know, we, we all deal with these things. It's not like we don't know. And just because someone doesn't always say it doesn't, doesn't mean we don't feel it, right? Um, but, you know, this is, this is one of the things. And what we do is going to be different for all of us. You know, some people are going to march. Some people are going to give money to grassroots organizations. Some people are going to work on policy. Some people are going to continue to speak out. They're going to teach courses. They're going to teach their kids. They're going to call out racism and racist policies. They're going to refuse to take, you know, PPP money because they know their company doesn't need it, but this other company does. They're going to ask how many people work for your company. They're going to invest in, in black businesses. You know, they're going to do, you know, people are going to do all those things and all those things are important. It's not just one thing. And it took us 400 years to get to this place. We're not going to solve it overnight, but there are a lot of really like very specific things we can do that would actually start to turn things around. And certainly there's a, I can tell you right now for, for me as an individual, I have, I have actually a hopeful feeling because I've gone my whole life with people basically acting like it wasn't happening. And I almost cursed just now, I caught myself. Um, but you know, when, again, when Amadou Diallo marched, it was, a, you know, it wasn't that, you know, if you looked at the, the people there, it wasn't that multicultural. You look now, it's like, wow. I mean, sometimes it's fewer black people than anybody else, right? Plus these things are going on in Australia where there's no black people and London. And I mean, it's amazing what you're seeing. And it's a, it's a global outcry because I think, again, you know, people have a chance to focus on it. But also there are certain like um, beliefs that people, I think a lot of good people hold, which is, yes, people do have the right not to be killed by police officers. People do have the right to have an, you know, an equal opportunity um, at you know, certain things and they see that it's not true. And, and I'm seeing people that I've never ever would imagine speaking out, speaking out. And that makes me feel good. It makes me actually hopeful. Well, how, how important is it? You know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I, I, and it's funny cause you know, I'm coaching an all girls uh, program and you know, and we started this program because we felt that the girls weren't being treated the right way. And that's why we started Elevate. We started Elevate because 
you know, my daughter was in a program where the boys got everything and the girls were just treated as second class citizens in essence. And they were, they were an afterthought. And that's why we started this. And, and now we have a program that really empowers young women to be the best that they can be in everything that they can do. And, and that's, that's really, you know, the mindset of what it's about. But if people aren't willing to, to open their eyes and say, this is an issue. I mean, we, you know, we just went through the Me Too movement and you know, you're dealing with, you know, the trials of Harvey Weinstein and, and, and stuff like this and, and, and what's gone on. Now it seems like it's almost, there's, there's this openness. I mean, I have, we just had major protests in Huntington, New York and, you know, literally protests down the street and, but they were peaceful. And you're right. There were probably as many white, Asian, it was completely mixed. It wasn't just, you know, this is all black people walking down the street protesting. It was everyone coming together. I mean, I know two of my coaches that were part of the protests and they're both white women that were in those protests because it's almost like, okay, the time is right. And, you know, it, it's strange, you know, everyone uses the term hindsight is 2020. Well, here we are. We're in 2020 and maybe this is the time for hindsight to look back. And, and not only acknowledge the wrongs, but so much more importantly, how can we fix the future? We're all athletes. You can't go back and change the last play. You got to go make the next play. So what's the next play? What can we do? And I, even, you know, you guys saying it, talk to me as a white guy. What can I do? I, I know you said, yes, you can do this, but how, how, well, do, I, how do I learn more? I mean, I think, well, that's a, that's a, a separate question, but an important question. Um, but, but I think we're starting to hit it on the head. Like w one of the things that I, I've, I, I learned in life and that, um, and that, that I've been reminded of more now with all this going on is that there's always three ways that, we, and really four ways that we can affect things, time, talent, and treasures, right? Like where you put your time, where you put your talent, where you put your money, that, that's what you, that tells everybody, that tells the world what you find important. Um, and, and so if you have an opportunity, like I, I posted today, um, you know, I've been kind of back and forth and I, whatever. I haven't gotten out to any protests, but I had a, a, a young girl who was a, a rising eighth grader at our school send me an email yesterday um, saying she's organizing a protest for Tuesday immediately I got to go to that right like that's my time no matter what I got what else I've already moved stuff around I got to be there for that right because I have to support that um but then I, as soon as I posted that on social media then I got a, a, a buddy of mine who was a coach elsewhere immediately sent me 100 bucks and was like get water get posters get whatever you need this is just for that right like so immediately he's putting some money into it doesn't know the girl you know isn't anywhere near me but knows me um, and, and so like, like that type of thing matters, the, you taking your platform and using it. And so that's why I said kind of four, right? The fourth is your voice. Like everybody here has a voice and, and, and can use that voice to speak up, speak out, speak to people, hold conversations, hold discussions. So I think the, those three things are always going to be important. Um, I kind of lost what was the, oh, and then educating yourself, right? Like we're at a time where there is absolutely zero excuse and I have to do my part to educate myself further than I already have, but uh, we're at a point where not understanding is no longer acceptable. Like there, there's, what else is there? What, what, do you, what do you have hindering you besides not being black, right? To not understand this play, right? Like yeah, I, I, I get it. It's subversive though. And people have, to be willing, it, I do think it's really subversive and they have to know where to look. So one of the things Absolutely. I would, I would recommend Absolutely. reading is the new Jim Crow. If you read the new Jim Crow, it'll help you, fully understand mass incarceration, how it went right from slavery to basically sharecropping to mass incarceration. And you can see how it's an extension of slavery. It, it, mm -hmm. It's very, very clear. The 13th is also great as well, great. if you haven't seen that. Black Tax as a book, it's super easy to read. And, and a lot of people, one, one of the things, and this is unfortunate. What was that one? Sorry. I'm sorry? What was that one you just said? Called The Black Tax. And unlike most books, it actually fully quantifies what, um, you know, essentially like all of the, um, the revenue that's been taken out of the black community, right? So there are like one and a half million fewer jobs and there's like 
I forget how much less money in the black community just because of the way financing is, because of all the discriminatory practices in lending, in housing, in autom automobile um, loans, in um, hiring, and all these other things. And, and it, it quantifies, you know, essentially the first um, global industry was actually cotton. It's actually one of the things that put the U.S. on the map, right? Black people made zero dollars from that, right? So like, or at least during, during the time of slavery. So it, it actually quantifies all those things. And you can imagine at this point, it's trillions of dollars, right? That are, that are out of the community. But I think educating yourself and understanding just how insidious it is, then can actually help people understand how they can help. It, you know, hiring is a really important thing. The people in lots of companies that are coming out now and saying that this is important to them. So my next question is, how are you hiring to support it? You know, investment in, in those communities. And I say investment because you know, if you were working with a vendor because you, you know, you, you buy widgets, then just ensuring that some of the people you buy widgets from are black or, you know, of color is going to mean that you're investing in those businesses, which allows those businesses to sustain themselves and to actually expand. Believe it or not, if you invest in a black business, you're automatically investing in the most diverse um, company. Black companies are far less, um, you know, like, you know, whatever, I forget what percentage black they are, but you'd think, you know, black company might be 98% black, but they, they tend not to be. They tend to be more like 76% black, whereas, you know, white founded companies tend to be more like, you know, 90% white or 92% white, right? So um, those things are, are important. And um, obviously, you, you know, speaking up and using your voice, as Chaz just said, that's always going to be important. Um, and there, too much of the time, what really happens is there's, you know, one or two like really, really obvious, you know, um, examples of racism and everything else is just people not saying anything, right? Because they don't want to risk what it does to them as individuals. They don't want to risk losing their job or losing their friend or being seen as, you know, something um, that isn't, isn't acceptable. You know, they used to say, you know, I'll, I'll say N-word lover back in the day. They, people wouldn't say that now, but they'd say other things. And even, um, I'll give you an example, Dave. When you talk about where you lived in Harlem at the time, you know, you say, oh, it's a terrible neighborhood, but you should also put, given the context that in, you know, early 1990s, late 1980s was the crap epidemic. Sure. So pretty much every city was going through this horrendous period in that same area, even before gentrification, that changed dramatically. Um, and there are lots of reasons for it. Um, but if you look at, you know, now versus 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it is a significant change in homicides and all those sort of things. And those things were far more about you know the, the drug trade and also about gang activity than it was about you know the everyday working people who live there like those people sure. who were trying to go to work and, and feed their families and what have you so all those all those contexts matter yeah no they, they definitely do so i got i have some questions from some of the uh, some of the viewers so this question is from uh, bridget lincoln and she's a she's one of our actual Elevate coaches. And she's a fifth grade teacher at elementary school with a population of predominantly black and Hispanic students. So her two questions are, with your experience in education, what are productive ways? I'm just going to go with the first question first. What are productive ways for educators to have open conversations with their class slash students regarding systematic racism and addressing these issues? Is that for you, Chaz? Since you're in education, I, I there there are some. Uh, let me see. I'll give you my email address if if, if anybody wants to inspire one more o n e at gmail .com. I actually have been um, people have been sending me a bunch of resources over and over, and I'm happy to uh, to forward those along. But I think there's a, that would be awesome. There's there's plenty of those, um, and I don't have one that comes to mind off the top, so that's why I'm I'm answering. Yeah, it and I would that. tell you guys, you guys would love Bridget. Um, she is she's 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 a teacher who's supposed to be a teacher. You know, all she all she does is care about the kids. She spends so much time, you know, getting her classrooms ready and helping these kids and. You know, she was so concerned when this was going out. And one of the concerns was, if we're going to have this, how many of these kids are also reliant on their school lunch and breakfast programs? Yeah. And, you know, they have parents that are, you know, essential workers where who's going to be watching the kids and, you know, all these different issues. Oh, and, and, you, and you talk about your story, like how many kids are don't have that escape from that type of environment right now, right? If, if that's what they're going home to every day, something like that, then... I mean, this is this is unbelievably traumatic for a lot of people um, right now.
right now. But another thing that from an educator standpoint is, is uh, begin to lobby your administration or your school board or whomever um, to, to adjust the curriculum. Like a lot of stuff that's going on right now is, is foreign to people because it's never been taught. Black history is not taught. Black history is relegated to uh, slavery, civil rights, and a couple books during February. Right. Right. Like Black History, yeah, Black is History Month, a part of American history and needs to be taught as such. Um, and it's not just Black American history. Um, so that's something that, that, as an educator, you have a platform to do. Right. I think also hearing from the the young people themselves. So, um, and you can probably Google this. I saw this a few years ago. There was this white woman who is a really great teacher and really cared about her children. Um, and she asked one of them. And I forget exactly what the question was, but basically the kids said, you know, you wouldn't understand because you're white. And it, it really upset her and made her really sad. But what she decided to do was to figure out how she could understand. And so what she did was she actually had the, the young people come in and actually start talking about themselves and their, their families and their heritage and all that sort of stuff. She actually ended up winning, I forget where it was, the teacher of the year. But she really allowed them to be a, a big part of what she taught. And you know, quite frankly, you know, when you think about communal learning, it is about the community. So it's not just a one way street and what teachers learn and what they can take in and how they can allow, you know, peers to be a part of that um, learning environment, I think is really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Gary? I would just add to that, you know, you know, because I'm just, echo, I'm basically just going to echo what Rashawn and, Ch and Chaz have said, but, you know, making sure that that classroom is a safe space for the exchange of information and, and to, and to, for the students to express themselves, I think that's paramount. You know, being being able to to let people know how they feel, I think, especially at a young age, is a is an amazing thing for a kid. But that's got to be a very safe space. But you know, the question was around how do I, you know, how how do I bring, provide an environment where I can address systemic racism? And I think that I'm going to come back to something Chaz said and something you said earlier. You know, the the system is broken. It feels it just feels so broken. And what we come to is that it's not. I think just that understanding that look, the system was meant to operate in this way. And if you if if you approach it with that understanding, which which means which means you have an understanding that there is inherent racism, it's institutionalized in the way that this that this country was was built. Having that going into that going into it without understanding means you're going to have sort of a different outcome. You're not fighting against it. You're not saying it's broken. You you have an understanding that it was meant to be this way. Now the now the question becomes, well, how do you tackle that? Right? It's not how do you fix this unbroken system. It's how do you come up with a system that actually works and addresses every individual as an individual. So I think that you know, if she can create that safe space in the classroom, I mean, you know, it was funny, like uh, when we were talking about getting to this conversation, like are we gonna get into redlining and zoning and, also, and, and that level of institutionalized? Because that gets pretty deep uh, and it requires some explanation. But I think this can be, you can have this in a more simple format. It's just a, a safe environment for kids to express themselves. And I think that's where you start. Right. Well, the other question that she has is, you know, all four of us, we're, we're lacrosse players. And, you know, I look at, you know, what lacrosse has meant to me. I mean, look at, look at, you know, Chaz, you're just too young. So we're going to leave you out of this. But look at our Brown State, you know, the Brown State team that we have that goes up to Lake Placid. And, you know, what that is about, it, it's, it's a brotherhood. I mean, it really is. And, so she wants to know how can she bring lacrosse into a community like this that is mainly black and brown and get them started, you know, where they see lacrosse as an opportunity. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, there are a number of challenges, but I think that there are, you know, these are challenges that you can overcome. I mean, we all know this lacrosse is not, a, it's an expensive game to play. You start there. So there are going to be some economic challenges around equipment, but you know, forget the helmets, forget all that. I mean, I think that if you can get into just, you know, get to a place where there are sticks available. Right. When you're going through drills, even if you're not wearing gloves and you're teaching about the game. One of the, one of the greatest things about lacrosse, when I, when I started playing in, in high school and I started playing at a late age, I was 13, I think, when I started playing. But my dad got me a book about lacrosse. And this is where you learn that lacrosse is a Native American sport and that it's a preparation for war. And you learn what it meant to the Native American culture. Um, 
it became, and people call it the creator's game. You know, that, you know, I'll never forget that gesture on my dad's part. He never understood lacrosse, but he liked watching the game itself and liked watching it play. I think that, you know, you're right. Once you learn the, what, how this game was formed and where it came from, yeah, it went through some machinations and it was renamed lacrosse by a French guy. But, you know, it, beca- it is about a brotherhood. It's about a preparation for something that's deeper. Um, and the way, you know, certainly the way we treat it as, as Brown Staters is, is, is I, as I think the way that it should be treated is absolutely, a, we're a family and we're supposed to be a family. Um, how do you bring it to these kids? I think you, you introduce it because, you know, for, for kids that are introduced to this game, I have yet to meet a kid except maybe my younger daughter who was not introduced to lacrosse that didn't love it. Um, so I think it's just about the introduction to the game. Once I saw it and saw what was happening, it was like, wow, that, that's it. I thought it was football and I continued to play football, but lacrosse was the game I loved. Um, I think it's just about introducing the game to the kids, putting a stick in a hand. Let's start, just start with that. And, you know, go, and going through the history of the game and, and where it actually comes from. I think that in itself is fascinating enough and, and warrants more explora- exploration. I think kids really respond to that. Well, I got to tell you, yeah, you know, I'm going to say it like a salesperson. Um, we are salespeople, we funnel, right? So I think if you want to funnel them, um, you know, the first thing you start with, especially with, with the younger kids, is, is all the fun stuff, the highlights, right? So you show them all the cool highlights. Um, if, if they seem like we have to show them, Ch- we have to show Chaz Woodson completely yeah. horizontal, about five yeah. feet off the ground. Chaz on the back. Show, them the, show them Nation United guys, show them those guys. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, then maybe, maybe you show them a game. Next thing you do, you, you take them to a game. And I think that's the thing that for me, I got into start playing, so I was 13 either, but I was hooked when I went to a game once. I went to see Hopkins play, and that was it. I wanted to play. Um, and you know, and then. Ultimately, you know, it's about equipment and things like that. I mean, look, I, I will say this. I don't think that it has to be lacrosse. I think it could be soccer. It could be other things. But things that create community are almost always going to be great. You know, as you know, um, you know, girls who play sports are far, more, you know, more likely to, you know, be successful in business, um, you know, not to be in an abusive relationship. There's all these things that go, go with it. Um, and I think in, just in general, uh, introducing young people to sports and other, you know, community activities like that is great. The one thing I, d- I do say to people, though, who don't understand lacrosse, and especially um, if they know soccer and basketball, I think lacrosse is the perfect sport um, from an excitement perspective because every goal is important, but but none, like, is too important, right? So it's not like soccer where you score one goal and everyone's like, oh, the game's over. I mean, literally people are like, well, we can't win now, right? right. <laughs> one goal. Right. And then there's basketball where people go back and forth and they score up and down, up and down, and no one cares that much unless it's a fancy dunk or a three. Until they, like, wait last, the last, they wait for the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. Yeah. The yeah. cross is exactly in the in between, right? Like a nice 13-12 or 14-13 game is you get enough scoring, enough excitement. You can even get up two or three goals and know you're, that doesn't mean you're going to win. Um, and I think that that part of the game, like when people see it, they get it. It's like, oh. Don't let them see the Brown uh, Yale game our senior year. That will not convince them. <laughs> I think it was a six four game in all rain. I it was four three. It wasn't four three. It was terrible. It was awful. So I I would add just a couple more things to that. One, you know, if you're trying to get them started early, you know, don't focus all your time and energy on reinventing the wheel. There are programs out there, right? So maybe if you have to allocate some resources, it's not to trying to build a program or spending all your time trying to gather up all these kids. Get the kids that you know you can get, get them to one of the programs that's already existed. Maybe that means finding transportation for them, or maybe that means raising money for equipment or something right. like that. Um, we don't have to start with, you know, 30 kids and, and do everything. Uh, there's also resources in terms of U.S. lacrosse to, to run clinics for them to get, get things started that way. Um, the next thing is, if you're really serious about it, if you're going to do it, commit to it. Um, one of the things that I've found is there's a lot of people that really – you know, well-meaning that want to see these programs happen, but then they get out there and it's not working the way they think it should work. Sometimes it's going to take time, particularly in these communities. Um, So commit to it, like be in it for the long term if you're going to do it. And then the last piece of this, and this is one of the things that really has always bothered me, I think is that, um, you know, sometimes we get started because we're, we're, we're well-intentioned and we want to give the kids these opportunities through lacrosse, but a lot of the opportunities, right there, sometimes there's community built at young ages, but the opportunities often come later down the road to people who continue playing the game and play at a high level. 
And so we get kids playing, but then, you know, and we, and we think we're in the schools and we're doing great things and we're supporting them and we're making sure they go to class and they're get good, getting good grades, right? But they're not able to capitalize on those, those benefits later down the road because they've never been pushed from an athletic standpoint and a lacrosse standpoint to become as good as they can be, right? right? It's not just enough to get a stick in their hand and get them playing. At some point, you actually want to progress them right? So that they can really be a part of the community so that they can benefit from it down the road. Well, that's um, what I love about Holland lacrosse. Yeah, you know, and but even even that took some time, right? Like a lot of these yes. programs have taken some time to get to that point where initially they were, you know, and I don't want to speak of Holland or, or anybody else, right? Um, like I said, all well-meaning. Um, but, you know, you're in the, you, the kids are in the programs and you're running summer programming and doing all this and it's great, but those kids are not matriculating down the road to places where they can play and then tap into these networks. We know, all of us know what, what type of network we automatically have at our, at our fingertips by having graduated at playing, having played division one lacrosse, whether it was at Brown or anyone up anywhere else, but a kid that stops at middle school or stops, you know, halfway through high school for whatever reason, maybe he loved the game, but just, you know what, it was time to do something else. He often doesn't get those benefits that everybody else got. Right. It's, it's not enough to just get them playing. You actually got to get them good and then follow up with them, introduce them young to how to network, how to access all the things that come along with being a part of that small fraternity, right? It's, it's a small fraternity, but it's not always an open and accessible fraternity for everybody that's been a part of the game. Yeah, no, it's definitely, you're definitely, definitely right on that. Um, one of the things, um, just in the beginning, you said, you know, what, you know, what's the, what, if we had a key takeaway, I think Chaz just said it, which is be in it for the long haul. And I think that's whatever it is, because none of this is going to change overnight. Um, we want it to change as quickly as possible. And we have to keep as much pressure on as we possibly can, but also it's not a one year endeavor or a six month endeavor, or even a couple year endeavor. It's, we gotta, we gotta continue to, to fight against and, and change the institutions so that it does work for everyone. And I think that that's, in all likelihood, is a long-term endeavor. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because you know, we'll, we'll end with this. And I didn't, I, didn't, um, I didn't prep you guys enough, but I'm going to put you all on the line. You know, one of the things about the Elevate Academy and really why I created this was because I wanted to take my 30-plus years of coaching and helping kids and, and, and give kids an outlet that they can come on here, parents can come on here, and they can really learn some really valuable stuff. Today, they've learned maybe the most that they've learned so far because these conversations that we're having are super valuable. And I love that you want me to continue to have these conversations, have more of these conversations with other friends that are part of this. And, and I will do that. But I want to ask each one of you individually, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? And I, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with Chaz. So Chaz, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? Always want to start with me. I was the kid in class. It was like, pray, don't start with me. Don't start with me. Don't start with me. <laughs> I jammed you. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been given phenomenal advice from so many people. I, I, and I've been fortunate to be around some great coaches, not the least of which was my father. Um, I, I think it, in, in terms of this stuff, the, the, the one thing that I would say, and, and I've kind of already touched on it already, is, um, you know, to, to commit your energy to this, right? Like, I, one of the things I tell players a lot is to um, work to capacity, right? Like, as athletes, we've always worked hard, right? Like, there's, there's nothing about that. But I didn't learn until I was – older to work to capacity. And I think um, the same thing goes in, in a situation like this. Like there are a lot of people that want to dip their toe in. There's a lot of people that want to have some kind of surface level conversations, but like, if you're really about this work, like dive into it, be really willing to commit yourself to it, be willing to invest yourself in it um, so that, that there's a, a real benefit down the road. Sorry guys, <laughs> office phone. Well, I appreciate that. How about you, Rasan? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I've had, had a lot of advice over the years. I think one that always sticks with me, um, my grandmother said to me when I was in my uh, pretty early 20s, um, she said, look, you know, you guys can be homeless because you're young. I'm old. I can't be homeless. Um, and what she meant by it was, 
you know, life is not a risk-free proposition. And um, in so many endeavors, you know, we're always looking for the, how can I do this, but also make sure that, right? That's why I always say that, that Kaepernick's um, protest was a big deal because he had something to lose. And I always feel like it means more when people have something to lose. And so it doesn't mean that this is risk-free and they're, you know, companies are coming out with statements and there are people, you know, backlashing and tons of people who don't understand Black Lives Matter or in, in my estimation sometimes are, are being willfully um, ignorant because they don't care, right? Are saying things like all lives matter. Um, again, all lives should matter, but that's not, doesn't seem to be the situation. Um, so there's always going to be risk in it and you have to be willing to embrace that risk, um, but do what you, what you know to be right. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, like that's going to work out, I think for all of us. Um, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's without risk. Well, your grandmother was obviously a very smart woman. Gary, how about you? Yeah, this is a tough one, Dave. Um, I'm going to go with this. Um, and this is something my dad told me. I got lots of nuggets from my dad and from his dad, my grandfather, but um, three steps back, which is to say you're in a situation, you have an emotional response to it. It might drive a certain action and that might be the right action. It might be the action that, the, that is called for, but even before you take that action, three steps back to really, to, to however long it takes to take those three steps to reflect on what you're doing, why you're doing it and is it the right thing so that you're not acting purely based on emotion because you can make mistakes when you do that um after you take your three steps if you're still on the same course and you've and you figured out why you're doing it and it's the right thing then then you go but you know I, I you know it's just a long way of saying don't act based on raw emotion make sure that you reflect enough and think enough about what you're doing so that you know you can limit limit your regrets in the future sure well, listen, the, the three of you guys, I, I can't thank you enough for, for being on here to be open and have real meaningful conversations. And, you know, it, it's important. It's important for us as friends. It's important for our country. It's important for our kids. Um, it's important for everyone. And, you know, for you to share, um, you've said so many things, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. The one, the one takeaway from me that I'm going to try not to get emotional. The one takeaway for me that was probably the hardest to hear was what Rasan was saying about, you know, here's my two 14 year old boys going out there and I'm worried about them when they go out there. I didn't have that with my three daughters, you know, so I didn't experience that and feel that. So, what you guys are going through is completely different. I, I thank you. Um, I hope you continue to have these conversations with other people and other groups because, first of all, all three of you are leaders. I respect you dearly. This is whew, this has meant a lot to me. Thank you very much. Thanks I think for the time. here's what I would say. For the opportunity, uh, David. Just really quickly as a follow up. Um, we all have to also own our privilege, right? So we as men have privilege and you may not have been worried about your, your daughters being, you know, attacked by police officers. Um, but you know, we don't worry about getting raped when, you know, when we go on dates, right? So that's where we're privileged as men that is, is not, unfortunately women don't have that privilege, right? That, you know, they have, right. to, they live their lives a different way. And we talked about the Me Too movement, you know, not too long ago, that's not over, you know, unfortunately being, being, um, quarantine has, has led to a spike in um, abuse, right? And things like that. And so those are the kinds of things, we don't wanna see those things happen either. And it, it, it takes us not forgetting about those things as well and, to, and remembering that, you know, we, we have a lot of different things that we're trying to do, but it's okay. Cause as, as humans, I think we wanna be our best and we wanna do our best. Um, and so it, it means we have to remain vigilant in, in all those areas. Well, listen, guys, once again, you know what? You elevated me today. You elevated our listeners. You, you gave us some real stuff to think about. And hopefully everyone's willing to not just dip their toe in, but to jump in the water here so that we can all heal together. It's, it's, it's one thing that I've been going through personally. It's, it's that, you know what? Um, I don't call myself a victim. I call myself a survivor. So the three of you are survivors. Um, 
keep surviving, keep striving, do what you got to do. But I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. Love all three of you. And uh, this is the Elevate Academy, and we are out for today. And thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take thanks care, everybody. Man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave.